nothing more encouraging than hearing the beautiful sound of voices praising God. Amen. This morning I've been asked to read from Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19, if you want to follow along. We are going up to Jerusalem, Jesus said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he'll be raised to life. They were on route to Jerusalem, traveling, and Jesus had taken his uh, disciples, his apostles, aside to tell him this. Uh, and what amazes me is, um, in the very next verses, we read about the sons of Zebedee, the, the mother, comes to Jesus and makes a request of him saying, you know, in your, when your kingdom comes, when you're in your kingdom reigning, can my two sons have the seats either side of you? Can they be your generals? <laughs> and, and Jesus responds to woman, do you know what you're asking? Uh, and of the sons, you know, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink of? that I just told them about, that I'm going to be arrested, persecuted, flogged, put to death, crucified. Can you do that? And he affirms to James and John that that will happen to them. They will ultimately die for the Lord, for the faith. And I know that you and I are called to drink of a cup as well one day and can you drink of that cup will you truly put the Lord first in your life will you make his kingdom the most important thing that you look to every day and that's a daily quest for all of us it's a challenge it's a walk it's a struggle it's a war at times but that's what we're called to do because now we live a new life in the spirit. And I think the Lord appointed this time, this first day of the week where we could commune together to remember him to help us because he knows full well we need this time to think about the cup that we share in and what it represents. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we come together at this solemn time to remember as we partake of this bread, Jesus sacrifice, Father, for sins for each of us, Father. We know that in our best moments we'd be prepared to protect the faith, Father, and stand for the righteousness of Christ. And in our very best moments, Father, we, we would be prepared to even lay down our lives as Christ has laid down his life for us. We would lay it down for him. So, Father, we ask that you help us to think on these things and really meditate on them in our hearts. Uh, the cost of being a follower of Christ that daily cost, and help us to use this special time appointed each week to recommit ourselves, Father, to what it is that we're called to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Father, what Jesus has done on the cross makes blood even more important, Father. Not just because it signifies the covenant that we have entered into in Jesus' blood, but because, Father, we know that blood is life-giving. And Father, we stand in need of mercy and forgiveness and your grace every single day. And it is such a comfort to us to know that through what Jesus wrought on the cross, we can be in receipt of that grace through the intercession of Jesus. Help us to be thankful for this at this time. Father, in Jesus' name I pray. continue to honor you. Thank you so much for being so good to us as we think about the way you have loved us, the way you've redeemed us. God, we're in just, we're, we are in awe of all that you are, all that you've done. Father, we give this time to you. We give our, our funds to you as we um, 
think about the kingdom and think about your purpose. We pray that you'll be at work through these funds given, through the, the money that's put in this plate, through our time this week, through the things that we do in your name. Father, let them bring you glory. Just be with the, uh, those that decide where these funds go. Give them wisdom. Give them guidance. Let them be dependent upon you for, for what you're doing and, and where you're leading. Just pray your, your blessing as we seek your will and seek your glory through all this. Reign in us. Uh, reign in our hearts. Be our, be our Lord and our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I'm excited for the opportunity this morning to share with you about some of the good things that are going on here at Green Lawn. Some of the money that you're putting in the plate is helping connect with, helping us connect with schools and with our community. Hardwick Elementary is located just a little bit north of us here on, on Chicago, and, and Bowie is located, Bowie Elementary, located just south of us, kind of our front and backyard of the church. And we've been able to connect with teachers there for a few years now. Kendra Griffin is over there at uh, Hardwick. Tammy Smith is, is over at Bowie. Some of our own children are over in these communities. But we're able to connect with these schools that are Title I, meaning that a lot of the, a lot of the children there at those schools, a high percentage, come from, from low economic situations. We're able to bless those schools. We're, we're invited and welcomed into those schools as volunteers. Some of you have read with children. Some of you have connected in other ways. One of the exciting things that we're able to do is provide hot dogs on kite day. Every spring, both schools will kind of have a Hardwick, especially Bowie starting this now, but they'll have a kite day and everybody in the community on a Friday night comes together and and they'll fly kites and, and eat hot dogs together. And some of us will grill, some of us will connect with the community, but everybody's there just kind of being a part of that community. And they know the name of Greenlawn, and Greenlawn has a great reputation there. We've met people at various restaurants where they said, oh yeah, you're the place that gives away the backpacks. So I love how God's at work in this place and how through your generosity, your love, your service, the gospel is going out in the community and people are seeing the Green Lawn's a place that loves people. Continue to pray for these schools, Bowie and Hardwood, but really all our schools in Cooper and, and Friendship and all the LISD district for our teachers like we prayed for on Wednesday. Continue to pray. If you'd like to get more involved, please see me. I'm Sean Gary, not Paul. Um, come, come see me. I was congratulated this morning on my new college ministry. I'm, I'm not the college minister. Uh, I'm his stunt double. But come see me, Sean Gary, and I'll, I'll let you know about some of the ways you can get involved in these schools. God bless you.
Good morning. Uh, Today's scripture reading will come from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 33 through 35. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. May the Lord bless the hearers and doers of his word. Amen. salt of the earth and light of the world. I want to welcome our students here um, and their families. I hope you will have a successful school year ahead. One of the things that I want to make sure that you feel an invitation is to be part of this church. Our goal for college students is that in the four years you're here through the equipping and through being a part of what's going on here at Green Lawn and your schooling, you will be equipped that wherever you go on the planet after you finish your studies, you will bless the kingdom of God. And so that's what we want to encourage and foster here at Green Lawn. Um, I've been doing a series that I've entitled The Cruciform Home. And in the series, we've been talking about what it means to be a cruciform leader. We've been talking about how what it means to have a cruciform marriage. We talked last week about what it means to be a cruciform queen or or wife and, and mother in a family. We even talked about what it means to have a cruciform self image, which is so different than what, you know, image building is about today in the world. Well, this morning I want to focus on the cruciform environment. And what I mean by that is what kind of atmosphere, what kind of environment is being built in your home? What can we do to form homes in such a way that they become shaping environments to make people more like Jesus? That's what we're going to be focusing on this morning. But I want to begin with something that Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. He said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I'm just wondering, did anybody come this morning with drooping shoulders? What I mean by that is, do any of you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world as you came into the assembly this morning? Maybe it's not the weight of the world. Maybe it's just the weight of your home and your family and you're feeling kind of burdened and bogged down by the weight that's uh, pressing on you this morning. You see, when I read the gospel, sometimes I wonder, what was it like to be around Jesus? What kind of environment did Jesus create to where people felt that his yoke was easy and his burden was light? What kind of environment did Jesus create where people could come to him and find rest? What kind of culture did he create? What did day-to-day feel like with Jesus? Well, J.R. Briggs said that culture is the set of rhythms, values, practices, and unwritten laws of a particular group or subgroup. In other words, culture is what you think, how you act, uh, how you interact, how you do your business. And in this series on the cruciform home, I want to ask you this morning, what is the culture of your home? What is the environment of your home? And what does a cruciform environment look like? Sometimes we talk about church culture. Is it high church or low church? Is it warm and accepting or cold and rejecting? Is it Christ-centered or is it church-centered? Is it about human kingdoms or about God's kingdom? And so again, what I want to ask you this morning and consider as we're going through the lesson is this. What is true of your home? Is it a cruciform environment? Is it an atmosphere where people are being shaped into the likeness of Jesus Christ? Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. A cruciform home is a place where the environment is shaping people for Christ. It is where the Holy Spirit is alive and active. So what makes for a cruciform shaping environment? i got six things for you this morning. First one is this. A cruciform shaping environment is where we love because God first loved us. Where we love because God first loved us. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. He says we love because God loved us first. You don't have to wait. Just love. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have an advanced degree to love. You can do that now. Jesus said... In John chapter 13, 34 and 35, I give you a new command. Love each other. You must love each other as I have loved you. All people will know that you are my followers if you love each other. See, I think a lot of times people wait and they they wait for somebody else to love them first and then they'll reciprocate. That's That's not what the word teaches. What the Word teaches is that we should be loving because God loved us first. We take the initiative. We reach out. We care for one another. Every one of Jesus' 12 disciples, even Judas, felt loved by Jesus. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced that the reason that Judas felt guilty after the betrayal is because he knew that he'd been loved so well by Jesus. Love is when you want what God says is best for someone, even when it costs you. See, we got to define what love is properly. So let me say it again. Love is when you want what God says, what God says is best for someone, even when it costs you. And so for that reason, there are times that love can be tough. 
Jesus corrected his followers. He nurtured their faith. He was patient with their mistakes. Even his discipline was an act of love. That's confirmed by Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. And so the love in a cruciform home originates in God's love for us. We embrace and accept his love, then we let it spill out of us onto the people in our home, as we talked about in an earlier lesson. We let God love us so that we can love others. Love sometimes means repenting. Sometimes it means reconciling. Love means correcting and cheerleading. It means holding close and letting fly away. That wise balance can be hard to find. Some homes get imbalanced. Some homes become overprotective or overcorrective or overpermissive. It's easy to love that sweet little baby sweet, uh, sleeping quietly. It's easy to love that spouse who just gave you a massage. But I want to ask you something. What about when you have a teen in your home that screams, I hate you? Or what about if your spouse betrays your trust? Can you love even then? Jesus did. Jesus did. I know a couple dear to me where the wife violated her vows. She even blamed her husband for it. But he kept loving her, kept enduring, kept seeking her best and for her to return to him and to Christ. And over a two-year period, this is going on, and finally she came to her senses. And here's what she said in the aftermath of that. She said, he kept loving me through my insanity. He kept loving me through my insanity. So if we want to have cruciform home, we need to love because God first loved us. That's the love that never fails. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about in a cruciform home. Second thing, to have this kind of Christ forming, Christ shaping environment, we need to respect because we are family. We respect because we are family. Jesus treated everyone with dignity and respect. You didn't have to win it. You didn't have to prove you deserve to be respected. Jesus respected Simon the Pharisee. He respected Pilate the Roman governor. He respected Peter the denier. And he respected Judas the betrayer. He never sought to humiliate or embarrass someone just because he could. He respected people. No matter how scarred or perfect, no matter how sick or how well, how poor or how rich, how discarded or how popular the person may have been, Jesus gave dignity to every person. He touched the leper. He answered the questions of the powerful. He allowed himself to be touched by the sinners and he studied with the self-righteous. He respected every person. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul tells wives to respect their husbands, verse 33. Peter tells husbands to honor their wives, 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Paul tells children to honor and obey their parents, and he tells parents to bring their children up in God's ways, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. We are to respect one another in our homes. Treat one another with dignity. Good manners arise from this mutual respect. We, we ought to be comfortable, and it ought to be common for us to say please and thank you, and for us to ask permission, and to keep each other informed, and to be helpful. When my wife Laurie brings home groceries, our boys jump up to help her bring those groceries in. Of course, they should, because they eat most of them, okay? But... They're seeking to be helpful. One of the things I love is to honor a person on his or her birthday. We'll sit around the table and we'll go from each person and we'll say, what do you appreciate about whoever it is we're celebrating that day? In a home, if we, we want it to be a Christ-shaping environment, we need to make it a place where we respect. Even when you disagree, you can show respect. Even when you are hurt, you can show respect. 
You see, in a cruciform home, it's not about how others treat you. It's, how about, it's about how you treat others. That's the way a cruciform home works. Number three, in a cruciform home, to have this kind of Christ-shaping environment, we serve because we are humble. We serve because we are humble. I've got to tell you, I struggled with how to say, say this point just right, but I, I struggled with whether to say we serve because we're humble or we're humble so we serve. But regardless, Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves, Luke twenty two twenty seven. The master The leader, the Lord, got down and did the dirty work. Jesus' disciples argued about who was the greatest. Bruce referred to this earlier. About wanting those places of prestige. They argued about who was the greatest while Jesus got a towel and he washed feet. That's so different. Most kings sought palaces while King Jesus had no regular place to lay down to sleep. That's how he approached life. Pilate flaunted his authority from Rome while Jesus humbly submitted to death on a cross. That's the way our master lived. That's what we're called to do as well. You see, church in a cruciform home, no one is too good. No one is too good. No one's too good to wash, to, to clean a toilet in a cruciform home. All right? I've told you before, I have two every week that I clean because I need to keep that humility. No one is too good in a cruciform home to carry out the trash. No one is too good in a cruciform home to wash the dishes. No one is too good in a cruciform home to stop and say thank you. And let me just say at this point, men, because we're the leaders, this is where we need to step up and and create an example in our homes. All right? You're not too good to do any of that stuff. And so be an example in that way. I've been in homes where children are asked to take out the trash or they're asked to wash the dishes and they whine. Mm, you know, Or they argue or they ignore and they go on playing their game, whatever it is. And on the other hand, I've been in homes where children don't wait to be asked to do something. They immediately get up and go to their parents and ask, how can I help? What can I do for you? So you tell me, which one is shaped by Christ in the cross? Which one is a cruciform believer? Number four. In a cruciform home to create an environment that shapes people into Christ's likeness, we trust because we speak truth. We trust because we speak truth. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, Paul writes, Those who are trusted with something valuable must show that they are worthy of that trust. Do you realize in a home what kind of value we're dealing with? In a home, people are entrusting themselves to other people. Parents are particularly trusted by God to care for their priceless children. That's an awesome trust. Trust is the foundation of every good and healthy relationship. And the basis of trust is truth. So if you are regularly uh, being lied to, it it can be hard to trust. Because trust is based on truth telling. And if you're living right now and you're having a hard time, you're going around saying, why doesn't anybody trust me? Why don't people trust me with things? Have you ever stopped to consider it maybe because you're not telling the truth regularly? See, trust is based on truth. And the reality is children can ask hard questions, awkward questions at times. Like, how did mommy get a baby in her tummy? Okay, you got to deal with that question at times. My, my son Jared, when he was four years old, asked, what happens when you die? How do you explain that to a four-year-old? Okay. Or a child might ask, Granny, why are your teeth yellow? Okay. Children ask awkward questions. And so you tell them the truth on their level. 
To tell them that babies come from storks or that everybody goes to heaven when they die or you tell them that granny's teeth are yellow because she ate a highlighter is going to undermine... (laughs) It's going to undermine your trustworthiness, okay? So tell the truth on their level so that they can understand. I find it interesting that Jesus sent his, or, or Jesus who knows all hearts, assigned a thief to be treasurer of his followers. You ever think about that? Jesus knows people, people's hearts, and yet he allowed Judas, a thief, to be the treasurer. He trusted Judas. Jesus sent his disciples out on an eternal mission, showing that he believed in them. And guess what? He's done the same with us. You and I have an eternal mission. You and I have been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Sean talked about earlier. We have opportunities in our community to make a difference and to help people come to know Christ. And so he has trusted us with that. And he wants us to trust him in return. And he's not given us ever any reason not to trust him because he has always told us the truth. He's always told us the truth. You know, none of us are fully trustworthy. But we want to live up to the trust that others place in us. And that begins by telling the truth. Don't lie. Don't lie. That's how trust is built. The members of our family feel secure in putting their life and well-being in our hands. That's an amazing trust. I taught our four boys how to drive. I had to trust them with my car and our lives. I expected them to be truth followers by driving within the speed limit, obeying the laws of the road, and caring for my vehicle whether I was with them or not. It's a trust. And the only way that you continue to build trust is by telling the truth and doing what truth is. And as children mature, they can be given more privileges and more responsibilities as they show themselves trustworthy. That's the way it works in a cruciform home. And in that environment, we're shaped into Christ's likeness. Number five, in a Christ-shaping environment, we are resilient because of our hope. We are resilient because of our hope. In talking about God's promises, the writer of Hebrews said this, Hebrews 6, 19. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Now, ask you a question. What is the greatest comeback of all time? What is the greatest comeback of all time? Now, some of you sports fans are scanning your catalog right now of memories to think about what was the greatest comeback of all time. Well, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't on a field and it wasn't on a court. It was from a tomb. All right? As Mark chapter 16 and verse 6 says, the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. That's the greatest comeback of all time. Because they had been with Jesus, his disciples had been rising to new life ever since. But it has to be by His power. It has to be through Him that we have these kinds of comebacks. That we have these, this kind of resiliency. When they were threatened, they were able to come back. When they were beaten, they came back. When they were imprisoned, they kept coming back. In fact, Roman Emperor Constantine finally said, We can't crush them. These Christians, we keep putting them in prison. We keep uh, putting them to death. We can't crush them. So he legalized Christianity and ended the Roman persecution and actually embraced Christianity. Why? Because they kept coming back. 
I know that many of you are well aware of this. Life can give you a pretty good kick. You get kicked around because of sins or guilt or shame or failures or mistakes or insults or rejection. But I'm here to tell you this morning that because of our hope in Jesus Christ, we can keep coming back. We can be resilient. You see, when your faith is not defeated even by death, you can bounce back from anything. Anything. Cruciform homes have a resiliency to overcome financial losses, relational conflicts, and emotional disappointments. I have a friend who kept trying to share the gospel with her husband. For 17 years they were married, and the answer was no, 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 no. And there was disappointment after disappointment as she tried to get him to follow Jesus. And then one day, he said yes. One day he finally said, okay, let's go to the baptistry. I'm ready to be baptized into Christ and follow Jesus. And it was so interesting in the aftermath of talking to him about that, that he credited her with the persistence and resilience that came from our hope in Christ, our cruciform hope. See, when you're in Christ, you can come back from anything. Number six. To have this cruciform, Christ-shaping environment, we have joy because of peace. We have joy because of peace. Some of you, I'm sorry to say, know this very personally. It's not fun to be in a home with constant tension. It's not fun to be in a home where there are frequent arguments and bitter feelings. Some of us know that. We're going through that right now, aren't we? Yet in his parting words, Jesus said this in John 14, 27, I give you peace, the kind of peace that only I can give. It isn't like the peace that this world can give, so don't be worried or afraid. Did you catch that? Don't be worried or afraid. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of peace I want. I want the kind of peace that I don't have to be worried. I want the kind of peace that I don't have to be afraid. But what we have to understand is that you can only find that in Jesus Christ. That's the only place you're going to find that. Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, Jesus saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Did you see that? Joy was matched with the cross. And so is it possible that Jesus had peace while agonizing on the cross? Did the cross even become a joy of sorts to Jesus Christ because of what it accomplished? You see, joy is an inner uh, contentment or pleasantness that comes because you are at peace with God, you are at peace with others, and you are at peace with self. I have seen people whose lives were messy, but they came to their senses and they made peace with the other people in their lives. And joy followed them even when their circumstances of debt or lost job or imprisonment or addiction was still very real. But see, what happened is they quit fighting God and they quit fighting others and they quit quit fighting themselves and they started feeling peace. In fact, one man told me through the prison glass separating us, he said, I'm actually glad this happened to me. He said, now I can stop running and start making things right. See, for years, for years, he'd been running, tried to avoid the law. For for years, he'd been trying to run away from the mistakes he had made in his younger years. But when he finally realized and had the reality in front of him, he was thankful that he could make things right. Church and cruciform homes, you enjoy a togetherness. Too many homes have been divided by technology. Now think about this. 
One person is in his room playing video games. Another is Facebooking on the computer. Another is talking on her phone while someone else is watching television. We are divided because of technology. You need to eat together with time out from technology. So you can talk to one another. So you can get to know one another. It brings peace. It brings joy instead of loneliness. We can have 10,000 friends on Facebook and we can have all kinds of contacts on our phone and still feel lonely because we're not talking to the person right in front of us. Church, we need that kind of peace in our relationships. One of our favorite times as a family was playing the five-question game. That's what I called it. If you've ever heard or played the game Loaded Questions, it's very similar to that. But I just want to note for the record that my five-question game, actually, I came up with that before the Loaded Question games came out. Okay, I want credit for that. And we would ask questions. You know, and my kids loved it. They would often ask, hey, let's play the five-question game tonight. We'd do things like, if you could be uh, a, an astronaut, a famous athlete, or an artist, which would you be? You know, they gave us a chance to kind of know one another's hearts. Or we'd ask, what's your favorite time of the year? Or if you needed wise advice, who besides your family would you go to? And so we'd have these questions and, and, and share with one another and learn from one another and laugh with one another. Church, relational peace brings that joy of inner contentment in a cruciform home and allows people to be shaped like Christ. I went to a small town public school where there were many good and God-fearing people. But it was not an environment that encouraged faith or taught much about Jesus or even expected much of us morally beyond just basic civility. When it came time to choose a college, my dad always wanted me to go to Freed Hardeman College, a Christian college in West Tennessee. And I told my dad for years leading up to it, I said, Dad, I have no desire, I have absolutely no interest in going to school there. I am not going to school there. But when I went there on a basketball recruiting visit, I was amazed by the environment. The character of the people, the kind of conversations we had, the openness about Christ. And I remember coming away from that weekend and going back and telling my parents that that was a taste of heaven that I'd never had before, never experienced before. Unfortunately, there may be hellish moments that your home must endure, but a cruciform home will give you a taste of heaven. A cruciform home will give you a taste of heaven. And so what I'm saying to each of us as individuals and us as families is, you seek to create it. Don't wait for somebody else. Children, don't wait for your parents to create that environment. Parents, don't wait for children to create that environment. You take the initiative. Do your part. Love. Be humble. Speak truth. Show respect. Be a peacemaker. You do that in your home to create a cruciform environment. Celebrate your traditions. Memorialize your loved ones. Tell your family stories. Make your home an honoring environment of love, respect, servanthood, trust, resilience, and joy. Have a kingdom culture in your home where Jesus is the king and his word and his will and his ways are simply obeyed because he reigns. Are you following him? Is he the king of your life? Is your home, is your life a cruciform one? If not, and we can help you do that, I encourage you to come. Let's stand and sing.